following the sort of shift in understanding philosophy that Socrates was, where we kind of have a division of pre-Socratic and then those Socratic thinkers that move forward. The next major philosopher to be that important and impactful, especially for Western philosophy, is St. Augustine. We are going to turn our attention to him today. Augustine was born in 354 in what is today Algeria, but in the middle of the 4th century uh, was kind of the orbit around Carthage. Uh, Hippo Reganius was a Roman major city at the time uh, and was one of the major centers of Christianity. It is going to be one of those places in North Africa, uh, along with Alexandria and Egypt, that really become very influential both in ph philosophical thought uh, and monastic life as he will progress and become a bishop of this area. Uh, Augustine encountered many of these different trends and thoughts and really had to kind of govern and navigate both the political and religious landscape of North Africa at the time. Augustine's early impact was a little bit more questionable on how we would look at things. He was, by all accounts, very much engaged in philosophical and theological discussions of the day. Uh, he would later become a bishop, uh, was very much engaged in discussions of, of heresy and defining doxa, what it is, the, the right truth. Uh, and this has a very clear impact into the realm of philosophy as well. But really, outside of North Africa uh, and Southern Italy, uh, he didn't have a huge impact immediately at the time of his death. Uh, there was no organized schools that would kind of emerge around him like you would find among some other leaders, especially in the monastic communities of, of Hippo Reganius around Carthage or out in the Egyptian desert. Uh, or the Desert Fathers all have different schools and thoughts that emerged. He didn't have any direct disciples who were continuing on his particular understanding of philosophy. Um, but his impact uh, will continue to grow as time goes by. While there might not have been an immediate school of Augustinians, uh, by the Middle Ages, there's a half a dozen or so different religious orders, especially in the West, that claim to come from him and his teachings directly. Uh, and his impact continued to grow, especially in the realm of personal psychological approach to philosophy and theology uh, as the centuries progress. Really, he was one of the most prolific geniuses that humanity has ever known and is admired not only for the number of his works, if any of you have ever claimed to read all of St. Augustine, usually everyone's going to look at that as a, as a little spurless, if nothing else, right? Uh, but also for the variety of the subjects uh, that he addresses that really kind of covers the whole realm of thought. He is the only church father who has a work that is counted as a classic in world literature, that is, his Confessions, uh, which you guys are reading sections out of uh, for this class. Uh, it is also very remarkable that many critics, uh, Protestants as well as Catholics, are usually unanimous in placing Augustine as one of the highest, if not the most important, doctors of the Church for the West and proclaiming him to be the greatest of the Western fathers to whom all other interpretations are going to come out of that. Um, this is really a claim for the West, not as much for East. Uh, for Eastern Christianity, he's seen in a more minor role uh, and subservient to other philosophical uh, and theological thought. But for the West, Augustine really reigns supreme. Lutherans, Calvinists, as well as Catholics view his theological system as the foundation for theology. And in many ways, these are interpretations of his work. It has been said that all of Western civilization or history is simply an appendix to his work, The City of God, which kind of lays out the discussions of what religious and social life would look like, both on earth and the city of God uh, within the church. What's really interesting is to think of Augustine as a philosopher. It would be 
inaccurate to say that he's not a philosopher. Uh, but for him, philosophy was always something subservient to theology. It was always something that was used to understand and explain divine wisdom, as opposed to just practical concerns. He isn't a classically trained philosopher. Uh, he didn't have any formal training, really, in it much at all. Uh, he didn't really like Greek, which was the language of philosophy during his era. And he didn't even read all or most of Plato or Aristotle. But again, Augustine was a philosopher. Generally speaking, we would put him in the category of a Neoplatonist. And later on, we will address some major Neoplatonists, such as Plotinus uh, and Proclus. Uh, and really, he kind of transmitted these ideas and reinterpreted them into a Christian mold. He'll differ from these classical Neoplatonists by making being and not notions of unity or goodness as the basis of God. As will make sense much later on, uh, God becomes the one, the eminent and transcendent being and the creator and the ruler. This is where these ideas will move from, but has this sort of understanding in a Neoplatonist mold. Self-knowledge also becomes the starting point in knowing God. Since the knowledge of our self is knowledge of the soul, which arises from God, and you can see some connections here with Plato already, this is found both within the sort of biblical and Neoplatonist cosmology, uh, and is also addressed by other Christian theologians, uh, such as Boethius, uh, where they might originate differently. Uh, the goal for Augustine, and for a lot of sort of philosophical, theological movement throughout the Middle Ages is a sort of mystical union of the self, the noose or the spiritual intellect with God, or from the Platonist perspective, the one. And so we have this sort of idea that the mind or spiritual intellect is the active intellect, while the soul is the sort of passive intellect, and they work and are connected in this sort of way. Augustine's philosophy was always subservient to his role in theology, and so it would be most appropriate for us to always keep in mind that Augustine was a bishop, though he was not always a bishop. Um, this becomes his sort of defining characteristic of most of his later writings, especially those that were most influential within Christian philosophy and theology. He was a Christian thinker and wrote and addressed issues that were important for him and his church. This allows him to play with philosophy because he wants to address knowing and the realities of human life uh, and he, what impacts the soul. Philosophy is a tool that discussed the truth and therefore philosophy has value and impact within this theological and ecclesial framework. He based all of his thought on a biblical presentation of God as pure, omnipotent, eternal, and the infinite being who is approachable through the incarnation. This is the fountain of all of his philosophical thought. While Augustine should always be seen first as a bishop, as a theologian who uses philosophy, we should also approach all of his works understanding that he was a masterful and in many ways one of the best rhetoricians of his day. His early life he was a teacher uh, and had this in mind, notions of rhetoric, being able to use strong arguments that approach whatever perspective needs to be done to advance that cause. He will oftentimes overstate things on purpose to win an argument. And we can kind of see some of those pre-Socratic uh, and sophist ideas existing there as well within Augustine, where he is going to use rhetoric to persuade, um, even sometimes taking a stronger stance than he might believe, uh, because a little bit of hyperbole can help maybe show the weakness of the other position. So you should always read Augustine as a bishop, but also as a rhetorician, um, that this is the sort of purpose of 
argument is to win it to define things and again if you have to go a little bit farther to make the argument clear that's how things need to be done as a trained rhetorician augustine actually wasn't that attracted to christianity early on he was a manichaean an idea that we'll talk about here in a moment uh, and believed that most Christians were poor rhetoricians and really couldn't preach. Uh, he saw that the Manichaean perspective uh, really had a lot of strong emphasis on good rhetoric, and that's what attracted him to that. A lot of this changed when he encountered the works and eventually the person of Ambrose, or Saint Ambrose of Milan. He heard him preach uh, and he saw that there was a standard to which Christians, especially in the West, could attain. Um, most of Ambrose's writings were also sermons that were filled with joy and excitement, that the human possibilities were positive and not dour as many of the Stoics were as well. Augustine was really enticed by these ideas and through a series of discussions amongst other things, will end up making a conversion over to Christianity and will be baptized by Ambrose in 387. Throughout his early life, Augustine was surrounded by many different and differing opinions as to the structure of life. As already mentioned, things like the Stoics were around, uh, as well as Manichaeans. Augustine's father, uh, Patricus, was a respectable pagan. His mother was a Christian and is noted for her virtues and her constant prayer for her son and her husband. Eventually, both her husband and her son will become Christians, uh, her husband in 371. Augustine would receive a Christian education. Uh, his mother had taught him all of the catechumens and how to do the sign of the cross, etc. Uh, and at once he was very ill as a younger uh, man and he would ask for baptism. Uh, but as soon as he was no longer ill and not thinking he was going to die, he said no uh, and he passed on this uh, and deferred receiving this. And he also famously had a 15 plus year relationship with a woman to whom he had a son, uh, but was never married to uh, as well before his conversion. Uh, his son will also tragically die um, as a young man. Uh, so Augustine has other sorts of tensions in his early life. As a young man, the first real religious inclination that Augustine has is not towards the Christianity of his mother or paganism of his father, uh, or even to Stoicism that exists at the time, uh, but was towards Manichaeanism, a group he joined in 373. Manichaeanism will originate from a man by the name of Mani the Persian, uh, who lived 215 to 276, and it is a Persian philosophical version of Gnosticism. A uh, quick shorthand for Gnosticism is usually that there is a gnosis or secret divine teaching uh, that follows a certain leader and will help you move your direction towards a good God as opposed to towards an evil God. Usually there's a cosmic dualism for more, most forms of Gnosticism where there is a good God who is spiritual and a bad God who is material. Uh, and usually both are creating separate uh, yet overlapping worlds. And really kind of the appeal of Manichaeanism uh, is that it answers this sort of question that if there is only one God, then this one God must be responsible for both good and evil that we see. And for Augustine, this was really a, a issue that needed to be answered. And he really also was attracted to the sort of philosophical side of this religion, that th they had good arguments that seemed to work. As a teacher of rhetoric, he was engaged with many of these debates and will eventually go off to Carthage where he's going to win a literary contest on notions of aesthetics, on how things should appear. Uh, but this is also one of those first times that he became disenfranchised with Manichaeanism. Uh, and he states that they destroy everything but don't build up. Uh, 
Uh, as a young man, he was very much attracted to the power and destruction of all of your arguments are bad. But when you're not producing your own positive arguments, uh, he's going to start to see the weakness with that as he's beginning to mature. He also said that they lacked the philosophical answers that they would always promise to give later on or when you understand more then we can answer this question but not now uh, you're still too much of a novice or, or something along these lines finally he's going to meet a manichaean bishop a man by the name of faustus uh, and hear him speak and this really kind of broke his kind of engagement with this because faustus was surprisingly a very poor rhetorician uh, and again for augustine how good are you with rhetoric was very important. And so he was a Manichaean and engaged with Manichaean thought for about nine years uh, from his both early engagement and his final break with it. Uh, in 383, he's going to leave for Rome uh, and really doesn't get paid for teaching there. He'll end up going off to Milan later on where he will meet Ambrose and then begin his Christian journey at that point. In 383, Augustine will encounter Ambrose uh, and will spend the next several years uh, debating and learning and studying with Ambrose uh, what it is to be a good Christian rhetorician uh, instead of just a rhetorician. And he will convert over to Christianity around 386 and he is baptized by Ambrose on Easter of 387. Now, as a good trained rhetorician uh, who didn't think that many Christians were very good at preaching, uh, it seems a natural fit that he should become a good preacher. Uh, and a lot of times people were urging him to do so, uh, wanted him ordained as a priest. Uh, but there are many different stories of Augustine fleeing a town who wanted to elevate him up to becoming a priest. Uh, and really wanted nothing to do with being brought into higher religious order. Eventually, Augustine was speaking to one of his friends in Hippo and was praying for the people there and his friends. Uh, and eventually it's brought up that the bishop uh, thought that Augustine should become a priest there. And eventually, at this point, he relented and was ordained a priest in 391. Shortly thereafter, he went and founded a monastery in Tagsgate, uh, and as a priest, he also preached a fairly rare occurrence for uh, most pre uh, priests at this time in North Africa. Usually, this was something only reserved for bishops to do. In 396, at the age of 42, uh, he was then made bishop, and this will be a position that he will hold for the next 34 years of his life. Really, he combined the exercise of both pastoral duties with the austerities and, uh, of religious life, holding on to some of these notions of monasticism uh, that you're going to find amongst uh, those monastic communities and not always just those lay religious communities. His Episcopal residence became a monastery where he lived in a community with his clergy who bound themselves to observe his religious notions on poverty. Many believe that Augustine founded an order or of regular clerics or of monks, though he didn't give any sort of orders to do so and didn't give any distinctions. So those orders that kind of come out of this uh, are not directly from him. As a bishop, his pastoral duty was to oversee the spiritual lives of his practitioners which included writing profusely on matters of faith and doctrine. And this is where we see most of his philosophy. This included speaking out against many different heretical groups. And this is really where we're getting that sort of division of thought. It is in these polemics that we're going to understand both his philosophy and how it matured and addressed things. It should come as little surprise that Augustine, the rhetorician and the bishop, who wanted to bring people into the church and always loved a good argument, would turn his attention towards his former co-religionists, the Manichaeans. After all, he would be able to vanquish their arguments fairly easily as somebody who knew and understood them uh, as a practitioner of this religion for nine years. Kind of this came to a head 
in 404 when Augustine would end up having a debate with Felix, who was one of the, quote, elect of the Manichaean sect, and was seen really as one of the great leaders of this. Felix was propagating his arguments in Hippo and would invite Augustine uh, to kind of debate him, believing that he was going to be superior. At the end of this debate, Felix actually declared that he was vanquished by Augustine and his arguments and would embrace Christianity at this point. And they would kind of sign on to this agreement. And in many ways, in Felix's conversion, along with Augustine's, would end up beginning the end for a lot of Manichaean arguments, uh, both in North Africa and as a philosophical religious movement uh, throughout all of North Africa, the Near East, uh, and eventually in Persia as well. Near the end of his life, Augustine will also address the heresy of Arianism. Arianism was the argument brought forth by Arius and was the idea that Christ was of a separate or lesser essence than the Father. The Council of Nicaea, called by Constantine, was actually to address whether or not Arianism is appropriate to Christianity, as it had already been condemned in Alexandria uh, and other places as well. Arianism will then be universally rejected, but had found home amongst the Goths. Ambrose will end up spending parts of his life also writing against Arianism and encountering this. And the Goths still maintained that Christ was of a separate or lesser essence of the Father. And, and now, by the time of Augustine's life, ended up having most of Spain and parts of North Africa as well. The Goths had persuaded many of the Vandals towards holding an Arian position as well. When Augustine wanted to retire because he believed he was going to die, uh, he was confronted by both the Gothic and Vandal rulership who wanted to appoint an Arian to the bishopric instead of Augustine's hand-appointed successor. Old and ill, Augustine will end up holding a few disputations, refuting Arianism, and of course, emerging victorious as he as ought to do. Augustine is also essential in ending the Donatist controversy or Donatist schism. It began around 311 uh, when Diocletian, the emperor of Rome, mandated that all citizens of Rome take a loyalty oath, which included uh, under Diocletian's understanding not being a Christian, uh, and would then give you a sort of certificate that would show that you were indeed a real Roman. Um, there became some sort of controversies about this of whether or not Christians, who were rather explicit with the target of this, got a fake certificate if this would be okay. Uh, or if somebody had died, or if you can repent afterwards, and all sorts of other questions uh, towards this end. While the great uh, persecution was going on, there were some people who thought, no, you just have to suffer martyrdom, and that your individual holiness was essential. Uh, and with this also grew different notions for some, that if your priest or bishop wasn't purely and holy, what did that do to the sacraments that you would receive? This was the question that Donatus of Carthage would raise in 311. And Donatus argued that the moral sanctity of the priest and of the bishops who ordain him uh, was really what was important. Therefore, if your priest or bishop had unconfessed sin, before performing a sacrament, that sacrament was no longer valid. Therefore, if your priest was a bad priest, your baptism, for instance, wouldn't count. And so you would need to be baptized again in some sort of pure, clean sort of church. By the way, in 325, the Council of Nicaea will tell you you can't be baptized again. And so this causes greater 
uh, sort of controversy throughout the later half of the fourth century. And really moral questions of sin in all of its form became a major sort of question. Augustine uh, didn't like the power of, of this sort of group, and it was really right in his backyard. It was it originated in North Africa, and North Africa and Southern Italy are really the major places that the Donatist schism was taking place. And Augustine will say that no, uh, the church has a job. It is the dispenser of grace. So regardless of any other failings that might exist, uh, it is the church that is going to give out uh, the power. So if you have a bad priest or a bad bishop, even if they are a heretic, even if in their heart they do not believe in God, you are saved because of the moral authority of the church, the bride of Christ, and not based upon the value of the individual agents who are doing so. And this becomes very important uh, because it ends the sort of concern that people will have on whether or not their sacraments are valid. In many ways, this is also used later on for Catholics saying, uh, if you were, for instance, Lutheran and become Catholic, that you shouldn't get baptized again, um, that you, know, you were just baptized by a bad priest. They were so bad at it, they were a Lutheran or a Calvinist or whatever, right? Uh, as long as it's kind of following certain formula, Trinitarian, etc., that that it would be valid and just kind of needs to be kind of blessed as opposed to needing to be done again, because it is not the moral authority of the clergy, but it is the moral authority of the church. And Protestants are, by extension, kind of schismatic Catholics from the Catholic perspective here. Uh, and so really, Augustine, around 411, will end this controversy, and Donatism will largely begin to wane uh, if it doesn't entirely go away within the next century. The final heresy that Augustine will write against and speak out against is Pelagianism. Pelagianism is the arguments that followed from a British monk by the name of Pelagius, who lived from 360 to 420, who argued that human nature was essentially good. It emphasized the human ability to do all things good or bad, and it's all our, up to our own notions of free will. As a British ascetic, he will come to Rome in 390, and Pelagius thought here, in one of the major centers of Christianity, he would see the most holiness of life. After all, the baptism takes away notions of sin and the sacraments would make you holy. But instead he saw debauchery uh, and other such ilk and will reject the sort of faults that he sees in Rome and with this reject the idea that the sacraments are somehow transformative as well. He'll argue that we are by nature good and that God gives us commandments means that we have the ability to follow them uh, and therefore we have to be good and that God has given us a knowledge of right and wrong and choice and therefore we should have the ability to do all right uh, and never do wrong and he calls for this idea of moral perfection of individuals. Augustine will strongly uh, argue against Pelagius and will end up saying that we are not born good uh, and that we need the sacraments to even be able to approach to doing good. It is really out of this controversy with Pelagius that Augustine will develop the notion of original sin, which becomes kind of his key theological contribution. If you notice sorts of theology in the West, this idea of original sin is essential. If you look at Eastern Christianity, where Augustine is of lesser import, uh, the notion of original sin doesn't really exist. There are notions of ancestral sin, that we live in a fallen world, but not that our natures are corrupted and evil. 
which is kind of the argument that Augustine will move, that we have to have the sacraments. We have to have baptism to even be able to escape notions of original sin. Uh, Augustine, as a rhetorician, likely took this a little bit farther than he believed himself, uh, but was using this as against ideas of Pelagius and the fall that would end up existing uh, as a result of believing Pelagius' ideas that we are good and can do all good and be perfect as well. This sort of criticism launched in his Confessions in Book Two. Uh, he begins by asking, of course, who is he narrating this? He says, not to God, but to my own kind in thy presence, to that small part of the human race who may chance to come upon these writings. Right? He's thinking, okay, no one's ever going to read this, uh, but I'm writing it to them. Again, it turns out to be one of those classics in Western literature. Um, and to what end that I and all who read them may understand what depths there are from which we are to cry unto thee. We need to know our depths. We need to know our sin. For what is more surely heard in thine ear than a confessing heart and a faithful life? Augustine, as a good rhetorician, now points out an example of this depth. He says, theft is punishable by law, O Lord, and by the law written in men's hearts which not even ingrained wickedness can erase. For what thief will tolerate another thief stealing from him? Even a rich thief will not tolerate a poor thief who is driven to thief theft by want. Yet I had a desire to commit robbery and did so, compelled to do it by neither hunger nor poverty, but through a contempt for well-doing and a strong impulse to iniquity. Right? He's pointing out that he had this desire to sin uh, and why? Not because he was hungry or poor, not because he couldn't do any things, uh, but because of this impulse towards sin, right? That our, that our will is by default towards iniquity, uh, is the, the words that we used here. It says, for I pilfered something which I already had in sufficient measure and of much better quality, right? I, I already had what I needed and I had better ones than the ones I stole. I did not desire to enjoy what I stole, but only the theft and the sin in itself, right? That sometimes you want sin. You want that and it's appealing in its own sake. Augustine tells us the root of all of this inequity and this theft. He said that there was a pear tree close to our own vineyard, heavily laden with fruit, which was not tempting either for its color or its flavor. Right? Again, there's no particular value that these pears have on their own. They are not inherently beautiful or better or sweet, especially compared to the ones that he had as well. Late one night, having prolonged our games in the streets until then, as our bad habit was, a group of young scoundrels, and I among them, went to shake and rob this tree. We carried off a huge load of pears, not to eat ourselves, but to dump it out on the hogs after barely tasting some of them ourselves. Doing this pleased us all the more because it was forbidden. Such was my heart, O God, such was my heart, which thou didst pity even in that bottomless pit. Behold, now let my heart confess to thee, what it was seeking there, when I was being gratuitously wanton, having no inducement to evil, but to the evil itself. It was foul, and I loved it. I loved my own doing. I loved my own error, not for which I erred, but the error itself. A depraved soul falling away from security in thee to destruction in itself, seeking nothing from the shameful deeds but shame itself. Right here, this is what Augustine is pointing out. This is the nature of sin, right? That it is sin for its own sake, not for something else, right? As we were addressing before with Aristotle, right? As far as proximate and final ends. Augustine points out that for many of us, sin is an end in and of itself. We do it for its own sake and not for something else. Not that it is good by any stretch, that it is in fact evil, but yet we still move this direction. Those pears were truly pleasant to the sight, 
but it was not for them that my miserable soul lusted, for I had an abundance of better pairs. I stole those simply that I might steal, for having stolen them, I threw them away. My sole gratification in them was my own sin, which I was pleased to enjoy. For if any one of these pears entered my mouth, the only good flavor it had was my sin in eating it. Right? The only value that they had wasn't that they were exceptionally great. It was the value of the sin. Thus, it was by my uh, a sinner's own deeds he himself is harmed. Human sloth pretends to long for rest, but what sure rest is thee save in thee, O Lord? Luxury would fain be called plenty and abundance, but thou art fullness and unfailing abundance of unfading joy. Prodigality presents a show of liberty, but thou art the most lavish giver of all good things. Covetousness desires to possess much, but thou art already the possessor of all things. Envy contends that it's aim for excellence, but what is so excellent as thou? Anger sinks revenge, but who avenges more justly than thou? Fear recoils at the unfamiliar and sudden changes which threatens things beloved and wary for its own security. But what can happen that is unfamiliar or sudden to thee? Or who can deprive thee of what thou lovest? Where really is there unshaken security save with thee? Grief languishes for things lost in which desire had taken delight, because it wills to have nothing taken from it, just as nothing could be taken from thee. Right here, Augustine points out that many of the different sins, uh, the passions, desires that we have towards things are only really fulfilled in God. And that what we're going to see is that all of these sins are are really false in what they're giving us, even though we see them as having value and benefit for them, their own sake. And wherein I was initiate, uh, imitating my Lord, even in corrupted and perverted way, did I wish I only by gesture to rebel against thy law, even though I had no power to actually do so, so that even as a captive, I might produce a sort of counterfeit liberty by doing with impunity deeds that were forbidden in a deluded sense of omnipotence. Behold, the servant of thine fleeing from his Lord and following a shadow. O rottenness, O monstrousness of life and abyss of death, could I find pleasure only in what was unlawful and only because it was unlawful. But this for Augustine is the notions of sin, of original sin, that it becomes a counterfeit liberty that we do so uh, because we're trying to think of ourselves as gods in many ways, right? That we have a deluded sense of omnipotence by, by sinning against God that we will have more power even though we don't have any real power at all, that this is even something granted to do for us, right? So this becomes the sort of arguments that Augustine is trying to make here. This becomes the sort of foundations of notions of original sin that will kind of dominate Western Christianity and, and Western philosophical and theological thought following him. Tied in with this notion of uh, original sin, though, are also Augustine's notions of grace and free will. We can even notice in that previous dialogue that he had on the pairs that he was choosing to do things freely. Uh, I chose to sin, etc. And so for Augustine, we need to understand that we are free in our discussions. Uh, in his work on grace and free will, he says, there are some persons who suppose that the freedom of the will is denied whenever God's grace is maintained, or that we either have to have this idea that God controls and dictates everything, uh, or we're free, right? That, that there can't be an omnipotent God and yet also freedom. Uh, and who on their side defend the liberty of will so preemptively as to deny the grace of God. There is, to begin with, he continues, uh, the fact that God's precepts themselves would be of no use to a man unless he had free choice of will. But that God wouldn't give us uh, a direction if we had no choice to do it, then God doesn't need to give us that direction. And so that by performing them, he might obtain the promised rewards.
Proverbs 5 2. Uh, he says he is not inclined to understand how to do good, and they refuse to attend my counsel, as is mentioned in Proverbs 1 30, with numberless other passages of the inspired scriptures of the Old Testament. And what do they show us? but the free choice of the human will, right? So Augustine is addressing notions of freedom through kind of theological revelation, right? That we're going to hold scripture as our answer, as our test case, uh, and then also then applies these other philosophical ideas onto it. That no man, therefore, when he sins, can in his heart blame God for it, but every man must impute the fault to himself, that we are free in our own choosing, in our own sin nor does it detract at all from a man's own will when he performs an act in accordance with God, right? That you are choosing freely to do good as well. Indeed, a work uh, is then to be pronounced a good only when a person does it willingly. If you're doing a good deed and are doing so under force, Augustine says, well, we all, we're not going to count that as good, right? So he's using logic and rhetoric here as well. Then too, may the reward of a good work be hoped for for him who's concerning what is written that you'll be rewarded for your good deeds. Continuing this on, uh, God's grace is also maintained against notions of Pelagians uh, and that this is an old heresy, uh, not even a new one. He's going to end up saying that this old Pelagian heresy is not an accident, that it just shows up. Uh, but this idea that you might be inherently good is an old idea that has been refuted a long time ago. Augustine is really uh, trying to thread a needle here with notions of grace and free will. He believes that free will is absolutely essential, but we also have grace, which in some ways is God enacting God's will upon us as well. We are free to reject this grace, uh, but also God is free to extend it to us. See, Pelagius says that we're all good, by our nature, and so in many ways, the Pelagian position eliminates the idea of grace having import, right? That, it, for instance, you and relating with somebody else, that they are not also trying to sway you in an argument towards their position, because that could theoretically limit your freedom of choice. And so Augustine is trying to say that God has a, a way in on issues, but yet your will remains free. As you see here in chapter 29, uh, he says that if faith is simply that of free will and not also given by God, then why would we pray to those uh, for those who will not believe that they would believe? In other words, if faith is just something that's purely on your own, that God doesn't have an import in there, then why would we also ask God to help give somebody faith? Right? If your will is only understood as being free, if there's no outside forces or influences, uh, then you obviously can't interact with anybody else as they are, their will will push up against yours. This becomes a sort of, again, that, that, that tightrope that Augustine is trying to have us walk through. Uh, because again, we believe from Augustine's perspective that God is able to turn to belief wills that are perverse and opposed to faith, that they have some sort of ability to turn. And yet at the same time, God still grants freedom that while you might be opposed to God, you might remain opposed or you might turn because of God's grace that is also there. Just as if you and a friend are arguing about something, you might remain in your own position or you might accept their weight and their statements is true and change your position, right? And this becomes the sort of division here that a goodwill uh, isn't essential because a heart of stone can be turned away. In chapter 31, he continues that the free will has its function in the heart's conversion, but grace also has this point. It says, lest, however, it should be thought that men themselves in this manner do nothing by free will, because after all, the Psalms mention that you do have a free will and that your transgressions should be cast away in Ezekiel and other scriptural senses. So again, this becomes a sort of argument that he who makes you also says, I will give you uh, 
uh, and yet, yet we're able to not do what God commands, which shows that indeed our will is still free. Just as your friend may not accept your advice, uh, and yet both of you maintain your free will at this time as well. He ends up concluding this by saying, there is, however, always within this, this free will, that this becomes essential. But it is not always good, for it is either free from righteousness, which then serves sin, uh, and it is therefore evil, or else it is free from sin, and it serves righteousness, and then it is good. But the grace of God is always good, and by it comes to pass that man is of a good will, though he was before of an evil one. That you have different actions where people freely accept the grace and the will changes. For the bishop, this is done through sacraments, primarily that of baptism. And this becomes kind of the root of the argument between him and Pelagius as to the value of the grace as it is performed in the sacraments. But philosophically, we can understand notions of free will and how this relates to confronting ideas uh, and how is our will free if there's a God, etc., uh, as well. Augustine continues to advance his notions of free will in another writing he's got against Manichaeanism, uh, the argument of two souls. Manichaeans will end up arguing for this cosmic duality where we have a good God and a bad God, a spiritual God and a material God. And this was their way of advancing the idea that God can't be responsible for evil in the world. And then along these lines of these two different sort of deities exists also the idea of two different souls. That you have a material soul, which is evil, and a spiritual soul, which is good. And again, this helps explain the, the tensions that exist within the world, that any time you're doing something good, that is the action of your spiritual soul, and any time you're doing something that's evil, that's the action of your material soul. Um, and again, this is kind of the heart of Manichaeanism, to which Augustine will reject and refute uh, Felix on and end up winning the day, as mentioned earlier. Augustine will say that the idea of there being two souls, one that's good and one that's evil, uh, is redundant and doesn't make sense. Uh, in many ways, we're almost echoing the idea that Aristotle had in critiquing Plato's idea of the no notion of the ideas or the realm of ideas and then the material realm beneath it. Very similar sort of trajectories, although this is not exactly what Augustine is trying to do. Rather, Augustine says that uh, it wouldn't really make sense that we have two different souls in this way and also still have freedom. Because freedom and this free will is also essential for Augustine, as we were just mentioning. That if our good soul can only do good, then it's not free because it doesn't choose to do good. And if our bad soul, our material soul, can only do evil, then it isn't free in doing evil, and therefore the evil isn't evil because it's not doing anything that's contrary to its nature and its design and its purpose. Therefore, it would be doing good. Just like our good, we can't get credit for doing good actions because our good soul can only do good and is compelled to do so. And anyone who does a good thing under notions of compulsion is usually not seen as being good in that respect. And therefore, we don't have actual free will, and therefore, evil isn't evil and good isn't good. Neither of these things exist if, indeed, we're going to hold the Manichaean perspective according to Augustine. Right. So, again, the soul can't be evil from the beginning because God must have actually created one soul uh, that had a good source but might have fallen because of notions of sin, and then this is aided by grace, as he was mentioning before. Sin is therefore, uh, is the will to retain and follow after what justice forbids, uh, and which it is also free from abstaining. So we have to have freedom for there to be even the notions of sin at all. Right? So this becomes this sort of argument uh, that Augustine is really trying to make because we need the mercy of God 
Yet, at the same time, we need to have freedom and we need to give agency to both and in all respects. So in conclusion, what do we address here with Augustine today? Augustine is really seen as two things when we move forward. He is a bishop and his philosophy all extends out of his theological understanding. He's wanting to maintain notions of free will, the goodness of God and God's grace, uh, as well as the sort of fallen nature of humanity, uh, because we need to have this grace to overcome it. Augustine is also uh, a rhetorician. His arguments are usually strong and somewhat polemical, right? He's arguing against other people and the errors that they make be it Donatism or Arianism or Manichaeanism uh, or a whole host of other smaller problems that he encounters, uh, Augustine really focuses his attentions on practical concerns and his theology and philosophy flow from those concerns of those who are around him. While he didn't have any sort of formal training in philosophy, uh, he is following people like uh, Aristotle, a logician and a rhetorician. He likes logic and good arguments. He thinks, finds things that make sense and he advocates these. Uh, and so for this, his impact in the Western philosophy uh, really becomes second to none, as this is what's going to shape uh, the nature of things moving forward. Uh, as a bishop, he served. Uh, as a monk, he liked notions of asceticism. He'd also push for things a little bit farther than he might have even believed himself. Uh, because again, that's what's going to help keep things in line and win an argument. Uh, and for this, he was very successful in ending different controversies that existed in his church and in his life. If you have any further questions, feel free to let me know uh, or a list of other readings that you might want to get from Augustine, uh, be it on his confrontation with Manichaeans on two souls, uh, which was not in your provided reader.